Good morning. How are you? Bill Henry, Fortune Magazine. Hi. My assistant, Harry Hellenotis. Yes. Hi. How are you? Uh, well, come in and seats yeah. there, one here, and we've got, we've got, they're not here yet. They're oh, no. we're just doing the photo racks. Oh, oh, you know. We don't know the questions. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, that's not a bad idea. Right? <laughs> we can move around. We're, we're stuck once they get to the right. This, you know, is for our transcript, and thus, if your yeah. little machines don't get it all, why we can provide you with a transcript or a tape of what all takes place. Oh. I have to go one of you and Mr. Riley. Could I, should I say this? This is off the record. Well, of course. Just as you were coming in the door, yeah. uh, I noticed that, uh, that uh, one of my ear buttons here went to... Uh, Wait a minute here. When it goes dead, you suddenly sound to yourself as if you're talking different down the oh, well really? or something. Uh, uh, the they only last about a week. So it was. I is that see. right? Mm. Well, we'd like to uh, have you speak with us today about uh, Ronald Reagan as manager. You've got the toughest job in the world, certainly. And we'd like to ask you how you manage the presidency. And we hope you'll have some practical advice that managers in American companies and government agencies might apply. Let me uh, begin by saying uh, your friend Roger Smith of General Motors says that you've done a great job of focusing on the big picture without getting bogged down in the minutia and in the details. So we'd like to know which problems and issues you address personally and, and which you leave to subordinates. Well. I've never thought about what I do with regard to having a management style or not, but uh, maybe part of it is dictated to me by a little plaque on my desk there that says you can accomplish it. There's no limit to what you can accomplish or do if you don't mind who gets the credit. And uh, it is true that, uh, that beyond that, I believe, first of all, that you surround yourself with the best people you can find and you delegate authority, and you don't interfere as long as the responsibility and the overall policy that you've decided upon is being carried out. You don't stick your nose in there and uh, tell them how to dot the I's and so forth and what they're doing. You only interfere if somebody uh, isn't carrying out the responsibility. In the cabinet meetings, and I guess it has been a little different, I know some members of the cabinet who have been members of other cabinets in the past have told me that uh, there had never been such meetings. Uh, we, I use a system in there in which one thing I have ordered, I want to hear what everybody wants to say honestly and their, their views on the problems before us. I don't want, and I did this as governor to a cabinet California and did it here. I don't want to hear anybody tell me uh, what are the political ramifications of anything that we're talking about. That I want the decisions made on what is right or wrong, what is good or bad for the people of this country. But I encourage everybody, all the input that I can get, and this is what's led sometimes to those press stories of, since the walls of the building leak profusely, uh, that they try to pretend that they're, or they say, I guess they believe it when they're saying that we're torn with dissension or something. No, we're torn with, I want to know. And uh, when I've heard all that I need to hear to make a decision, I don't take a vote. I make the decision. Then I expect every one of them, whether their views uh, finally carry the day or not, to go forward together in, in uh, carrying out the policy. I know that you do a lot of thinking about the future and speaking with people who study the future. In, in your busy, crowded day, how do you possibly 
make time to think about the future and to do what managers might call strategic planning? Well, I think, I think that is the very essence of the, of the job and of, of all that you're doing, is aimed at uh, a continuation of policy. And where you, those young people that come here every once in a while for one reason or another, or even uh, children, uh, you, you have to think of them and what you're doing and how it's going to affect uh, the country they live in and the system under which they'll, they'll live. So I think uh, all your planning is, is based on where it, where it takes the country. Well, do you close the doors and, uh, for 15 or 30 minutes every day and just look out the window and, and think or project oh, there, forward? Or how there do you are do always it? times for that. <laughs> but you know something I learned way back over the years? There's another place where a lot of things come to you very clearly. That's on the back of a horse. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never given up riding, and I do that whenever I uh, have an opportunity, and I'll be having about three weeks to do that, uh, just starting a week from now, and uh, we get to the ranch. But uh, it didn't surprise me once when a doctor that I was going to uh, told me that when he had a particularly worrisome, um, delicate operation slated for the morning, he got up extra early and went out uh, to the stable where his horse was mm. kept in Los Angeles and uh, went for a horseback ride and came in feeling much better equipped now <laughs> to undertake that operation. And uh, I hadn't thought about it much at that time, but since then, uh, I found out what he was right. But yes, there is time to do that. Mr. President, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your crisis management. What? Your crisis management. Yes. When uh, uh, the embassy in Beirut was bombed and the Challenger exploded, all your aides said you were very cool and rational. Uh, corporate leaders face many crises, too. Can you uh, give them any advice on how to handle crises well? Well, I think it's, it's making the decision. Um, it's the uncertainty that I think leads to, to panic and, uh, mm -hmm. and upset. But in some things of that kind where the situation is so clear cut, uh, Grenada for example, uh, I was supposed to be enjoying a quiet weekend of golf as a guest of George Schultz down at Augusta Country Club and awakened at about 3 o'clock in the morning with the notice that, or the news that a number of the other little island states down there in the Caribbean had come together and asked for our help and that they would be helping too, but they did not have the manpower to do what needed to be done. And uh, 3 o'clock in the morning and on the phone to Washington, uh, here I'd made the decision of what we'd do. And I think, I think some of those, uh, those I found are less troublesome. Some decisions of that kind, where the facts are there before you, uh, and even sometimes if there's someone over here that's arguing for an opposite course, the decisions that I think give you the most trouble are the ones where you sit that in there at that table and you're all agreed on the goal, where you want to be. But there's a difference of opinion of how best to arrive at that goal. And uh, it seems that, that that's the one that when they've all finished uh, expressing their viewpoints in there and discussing it and so forth, that then I come back in here and sit down with that feeling of, I've got to make a decision <laughs> on this. And because there's a little right and wrong in what everyone is saying. There, they've got reasons for saying, won't this be a disadvantage if we go this way and so forth? And uh, those are the hardest decisions. But the other ones are actions such as uh, Libya and others. Uh, I don't know, the, there the solution is, is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. It just takes having the nerve to do it. How do you make those hard decisions, though? Pray? Trust the instinct, uh, 
say we'll go ahead and do something and we can always change it or what? Well, you said one word there. I think, could I quote Lincoln? Lincoln said he'd been driven to his knees many times in this job because there was no place else to go. Mm -hmm. And he said he could not perform the duties of this job for one day if he did not feel that he could turn to one who was stronger and wiser than all others. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I found myself uh, doing that. Mr. President, you, uh, you look as terrific as your pictures had led me to expect. Um, other, uh, other managers in high positions sometimes seem to, to let the job uh, dra drain them completely. How do you, how, how do you pace yourself from, from day to day? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I have a little exercise routine up there I do at the end of the day. I'm an, as a long history of athletic competition all the way through school, I have always been an evening showerer instead of a morning showerer. Mm -hmm. So I don't get up in the morning early and exercise. I go home from here and exercise, then take my shower. And, uh, and contrary to what a lot of people feel about uh, or think must go on in the White House every day, my uh, great many evenings, most of them as a matter of fact, uh, you find Nancy and me then uh, in pajamas and robe having dinner. <laughs> mm -hmm. and early to bed. Uh, but as I say, it's the thing of, it's, it's the not, it's the putting off of the decision that I think is wearing, because then it's mm -hmm. always back here and you wake up in the mm -hmm. middle of the night with it. No, you have to sit down and go at everything that you've heard. And I find here that usually uh, I've made the decision, if not within 24 hours, certainly uh, in the next, in the mm -hmm. second 24. It's so easy to become isolated in the presidency. Some of your predecessors have been said to have become isolated. How do you avoid that? How do you get out among the people? How do you find out what, what really is happening of consequence in this nation and indeed the world? Well, for one thing, I like people and uh, always have, but that goes with my previous life, too. I think most performers do, do too. Uh, people, you're stock in trade there. And their pleasure was, <laughs> uh, your success depended on, on their pleasure. But uh, no, I think uh, the very fact, when you go to the ranch, you're back in a whole different, and surrounded by the people that, uh, everything from neighbors to the leave the work for you and all. Um, I've, never, I've never felt that, that, that I am isolated from people. I grant you I can't suddenly say I'm going to run down to the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Any place I go anymore, I'm a group. But I, I can block traffic. But um, uh, well, here, the, and the, the very fact of, of the people in uh, the West Wing, they're people like everybody else. And they're not all top executives. Uh, you get to know them and you know their problems and their troubles and uh, uh, I just never have, have felt that way. And, and I love when we go out and like out on the road and uh, the opportunity to going someplace to make a speech. Uh, I, I delight in getting outside the beltway because there is a, a kind of a difference out there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I've always, I've kept the, the friends and the contacts that go, good Lord, all the way back to, to school days. Mr. President, uh, many management experts seem to think that fostering a certain degree of conflict within an organization has uh, good points. As you mentioned before, you get different points of view. Is there a point in your mind when uh, creative tension turns destructive? And oh, yes. I don't believe in that kind of conflict of competition where you've got two people that are really at odds. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that can get to be quite a strain if now and then you, you find that. And I've got to work to get rid of such a thing. But that's different than saying to everybody, 
look, don't hesitate. Don't try to guess what I may want to hear. I want to hear what you want to say. And so it took, it took a little while in California. It took a little while here mm -hmm. uh, for them to recognize that they could speak up. And uh, sometimes uh, I sit silent and the conversation goes back and forth across that table uh, disputing each other on points. But uh, it's that everybody could disagree without being disagreeable. And I have found, too, that many times, finally, when I come back in here and make the decision, I realize that there are going to be several that feel, uh, well, okay, their viewpoint was rejected. And yet, because the very next day, it might be that I'm on their side, what they say instead mm -hmm. of the other, I don't think any of them go away feeling any personal rejection. They had their chance to say what they believed, and uh, they're satisfied. Mm -hmm. You're known as a wonderful optimist, but uh, is there anything that you're hearing in those discussions now or sensing outside of uh, the White House that has you, has you worried, uh, a recession or perhaps an economic slowdown, or what is concerning you now? Well, all of this uh, thing about recession or something, all of the signs indicate, no, that is not the threat. Uh, yes, there are going to be some ups and downs. Uh, we didn't make the gains in in uh, 85 at the level that we'd thought. And yet, uh, then we had a, a, f a fine quarter comes along so that the graph is kind of like that. But as long as it's going on that upward tent, now all the indicators indicate upward uh, growth. And uh, this plus the fact of, let's take uh, unemployment. The, <clears throat> we have, in these 45 months or so of recovery, as of uh, through June, we, had, uh, we were into almost 11 million new jobs created. Yeah. We created 201,000 new jobs uh, in the month of June. Uh, well, no, in last month, month of July, 1,650,000 in the first seven months of this year. We have 111 million people at work, and it is the highest percentage of the, of the potential workforce. You know, they, they look at, in talking unemployment, they look at everybody between 16 and 65 as, as the potential pool of employment. And Things of that kind, uh, we know that uh, domestic auto sales uh, were up this year. So the, as long as those trends are going up there, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. What I am worried about is the, the deficit, not the trade deficit, the government deficit. I have insisted for a number of years, it is structural. It is built in to our government. We've been running deficits now, the government, for more than 50 years, more than half a century. Here and there, there's a single year, if you look in the past, when maybe it accidentally came out even or so close to it, but only a few spots here and there. And then we went into a whole new thing with the great war on poverty a couple of decades back. And this, the goals, the motives were fine, compassionate and all of that. But look what happened, 1965 to 1980, in that 15-year period, the budget increased to almost five times what it was in just 15 years. The deficit increased to 38 times by 1980, what it had been before. Well, this carried out what some of us were worrying about and campaigning against for years, and that was that you couldn't go on without one day this getting out of control, just as inflation. If you, if you remember, there were, during that same half century, we always had a little inflation, and they would tell us that it was necessary to maintain prosperity. Well, some of us said, if you keep on doing it, one day it gets out of control, and it did. The double-digit inflation just here in the uh, late 70s and, and uh, by 1980. 
Uh, what I, what is frustrating to me is that yes, every year I submit a budget, and every year uh, there are individuals that are talking about I want to spend more money on this, and uh, this is my pet over here, spend more. No one has yet up there has faced up to, except probably Graham Rudman Hollings, who are now trying for the first time to set a goal of a balanced budget. But no one has set out to say, let's correct the structural flaws that now have built in ongoing inflation. And this is, uh, mm -hmm. I could go on and lecture on the budgeting process wow. at the federal Mid -mid level. Mid Mr. President, a hard question to ask. Um, what, what is the worst managerial mistake you feel you've ever made? I know it will be comparatively small, but... Uh, oh, golly. <laughs> The worst managerial. Yeah. If you had to do all over again in terms of, of managing, what, oh, I'm sure what would you? Uh... Many things here and there, and you look and say, if we'd done this, uh -huh. uh, that. But I, I, uh, I can't. I just can't bring one to mind here. Okay. The thing, with not that mistakes haven't been made or situations have changed and. Things turned out wrong. One glaring one would be the terrible tragedy of our Marines in Beirut. Mm -hmm. Now, the decision was made, and uh, there was great agreement on it. And uh, the decision was made that with all those factions and with their own militias and so forth, mm -hmm. that what Lebanon needed was the ability for the, the new president, after the assassination of his brother, the new president of Lebanon, to be able to move out and reclaim for the official Lebanese military and all these areas that were being occupied by various factions with their own militias. And that we would send in this force, and it was, as I say, our allies agreed with us, it was four countries together that sent in forces for the mm -hmm. same idea, that we would send them in a kind of behind the lines, maintain order while the military and the government of Lebanon went forward to reclaim mm -hmm. uh, their country. Now the terrible part of the tragedy is it was succeeding. Mm -hmm. And that's why the tragedy. They, they didn't turn on the Americans and the French and the others there uh, suddenly because they just didn't want us there. It was the fact that they recognized that what we were seeking was going to be accomplished. And this is why they termed the, their goal was, through terrorism and so forth, to get us to withdraw. Well, finally, the accommodating terrorism was the result of a decision that maybe because the commanding officers didn't feel that we were in a combat situation, so the moving for personal comfort of all as many of the men as they could into one building. Yeah. Mm -hmm made possible that, that mm. terrible tragedy. Mr. Yes. President, uh, you started to address foreign policy. People say that you're a, a very good negotiator because you have principles and because your timing is superb. Now, recently you seem to have shifted from a strategy of tough talk to the Russians to one that's more conciliatory. What made you conclude that it was time, perhaps, to make this subtle shift? Well. <clears throat> It wasn't really subtle to me. <laughs> I came here believing that in years past, there had been a lack of realism in our approach to the Soviet Union. And we were sort of seeing them in a mirror image. That if we smiled and were kind of generous and so forth, they'd smile and be kind of generous. Uh, I was blooded rather early with regard to communism in the motion picture industry. A great many people have forgotten, and some are too yes. young to remember, <laughs> that there was a time when, right after the war, when with so many of us gone in the service in Hollywood, there are 43 guilds and unions in the picture business. Most of them are AFL-CIO. They had a thing called the Hollywood Conference of, or they, they had a, an AFL Labor Council, in which if one of those unions had a grievance and to the point of wanting to strike, 
they went to the council because it could affect all those other Avavel CIO unions and so forth. During the war, there grew up a thing called the Hollywood Conference of Studio Unions. Now, many of these were Avavel CIO unions, but they formed this kind of a rump, and it had been taken over. I'm talking now not of red baiting, but I'm talking about card carrying members that their members didn't know that, but that they were. And they used a jurisdictional strike not a thing of wages or hours or anything. There was a union in the most, there was always a rivalry between the craft unions and the stagehands. It goes clear back before pictures to Broadway. Yeah. When a stagehand, once upon a time in a theater, he'd go out and fix the chairs in the, yeah. in the theater if they needed fixing. And then there was a strike. And what the carpenters leading it back in those days insisted was the proscenium arch over the stage. That would be the dividing line. Anything that needed carpenter work out in front of the front of the proscenium arch, the carpenters would do it. Anything backstage, the stagehands would do it. But when pictures came along, it became the stages out there, they call them stages, where you make the movies. And a thing developed in which you had a mill in every studio where the sets were made. If this was to be duplicated, they'd make this in the mill, but it would be in sections. And then you'd see them wheeling it on wheels down the, the parts of it down to the, to the sound stage. And in it would come, and then it would be assembled. Now, the people in the mill were carpenters. But the people that put it together on the set were stagehands called set erectors. And they used this longtime feud, this conference of studio unions, to make the jurisdiction strike that no, the carpenters ought to be able, they should be entrusted with the job. Now, there were only 350 set erectors in the whole motion picture industry. So here was a strike to close down the motion picture industry to get 350 fellows. They wouldn't make any more money. If you have any different working condition, they'd have to belong to a different union. And the motion picture industry, or I mean the actors, the Screen Actors Guild, are the ones that we faced. What do we do? We've got a contract with the Producer, we go to work, do we observe these picket lines? Or do we go in, which would be in effect on the side of the unions that uh, are on the other side of that jurisdictional strike? Well, I made a proposal to our guild board that we should invite both factions to sit down at a table with us and with management present, and with us as the non-involved to ensure fairness see if we couldn't find a solution that would result in all the people of the motion picture business not being idled and losing their jobs. Well, we did, and we met daily, and it became increasingly apparent that, well, to such an extent that when Pan Wen Jam went on for all those months, uh, I didn't see anything new. I'd been through it <laughs> in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. We would go home at night after a meeting and thinking, boy, we're meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning and we're on, on our way to a settlement. 10 o'clock in the morning, that other faction would walk in with a handful of lawyers and with 17 new demands that had never before been introduced until the day came when we, the actors, said to them, that's all with the meetings. We've kept the studios open so far and we're going to keep them open and we don't know what you, the strikers, are going to do. You can get back into the business any way you want. But this is all over. You are only trying to shut down. And it turned out we, there was enough evidence and enough people who could leak to us that, uh, and weren't finally happy about what was going on, that yes, the target was close down the industry. Mm -hmm. And then with everybody out of work, the proposal would be made of one gigantic union consisting of actors, cameramen, crewmen, everybody. And guess who would control it? Guess who would control mm -hmm. it, That of one course. union. Certainly. Well, we won in the battle. Now, I've gotten so sidetracked here that I, I've lost track Is that track what of you're it. doing with the Russians? Huh? Is, that what? <laughs> Is that what you're doing with the Russians? But you seem to be uh, <laughs> making more progress with them yeah. now. And Realistic. This is where I got sidetracked. I didn't mean to make that example take so much time. <laughs> That's fine. But, uh, uh, 
If you remember the first press conference, I didn't bring it up. A question was asked, could we trust the Russians? And I answered the question by quoting them. Now, as time went on, the press sort of diverted to where I was accusing them of being liars and cheats and so forth. But I quoted to them what the Russians themselves, the Soviets, have said in communism, that anything is moral, lying, cheating, stealing, anything that furthers the socialist cause. So they reserved unto themselves the right to do these things, and that the only immorality, this is in all of their own writings, immorality is anything that is inimical to the spread of socialism. So I answered the question with those quotes, and uh, it sure did uh, make the news. But uh, I wasn't going to retreat from that, and then it was about that same time or shortly thereafter that, well, in the downing of that plane that I referred to it as an evil empire. Hmm. Well, we didn't, we couldn't have any meetings because uh, uh, they kept dying on me. <laughs> over there, there wasn't yes. anyone to meet with. <laughs> yes. And for months yes. they would be incommunicado. <laughs> yes. Wouldn't even know what they were doing. Finally, along came this, this new leader. And uh, Did you get got, along better with him? Huh? Did you get along better with yes. him? Yes. And I think not because any difference. I, I think he believes completely in their system. I think he also believes, having grown up in it, in their propaganda. But at the same time, he has big economic problems. Mm -hmm. And he's realistic enough to know that uh, he's got to make some moves to solve their, solve those problems, resolve those problems. And therefore, we can sit down and talk to each other, and I'm not sitting there saying, oh, gee, if he smiles, great, we've won a victory. Mm -hmm. No, we, okay, this is again like back there in those negotiations. He's got some problems that need solving, and we've got some problems that need solving, and uh, okay, how close can we come together on something in which uh, it'll be beneficial to both sides. When do you think you can cut a deal with him? Well, I have to call attention to the fact that he is the first Russian leader in the history of the Soviets who has ever proposed reducing the number of weapons, eliminating weapons they already have. Now, that, that's a great milestone. That says something about what their problem is, the economic problem. And uh, I, think, I think we can do, do business with him, but it's going to be on that realistic uh, note. I find him uh, affable, he's completely different than many of the leaders that I've met with uh, prior to this from, uh, from their side. But uh, again, I, I don't go with any illusions that I can uh, convert him or talk him into anything else. He's got a system we don't like. They don't like our system. Okay, we got to live in the world together. Now, do we want to live in the world fighting each other, or do we want to live in the world at, at peace? And uh, I honestly think there's a, a basis for us being able to find agreement. Do you have any uh, words of advice for American managers? Do you have any general words of advice for uh, the managers of American business and the economy? given that you've got uh, the number one chief executive's job in the country and indeed in the world? Well, uh, yes, I think it's, uh, I don't know that I should be advising them. You see, I've lived here <laughs> under the illusion, both as governor and as president, that I was kind of copying them, <laughs> doing what the successful CEOs did. <laughs> well, they'd like to copy you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, I think that uh, you take a position and set a policy that you believe is the best way to meet your goal and uh, get back to those three rules that I said we followed in negotiations. Uh, is it good for us? Is it uh, fair to the other fellow? And is it fair to the customer? Or did I say that earlier here? That would, hey, you didn't say good. it earlier here, but we're <laughs> delighted to use it. Oh, well, this was, <laughs> this was this was the guild's rule in negotiations. Is it fair to actors? Is it fair to the other fellow? Mm -hmm. And is it fair to the customer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we felt we could never demand something that would make 
of picture making so costly that they would either make a picture less good than it could be or would raise the price of admission beyond what it properly should be. And we never violated those three rules. And uh, I remember an occasion when we won a point. There were some independent fly-by-night producers that were victimizing actors. You know, actors aren't just all of a single breed. There's the contract player, there's oh, the star with so. a big salary, there's the individual that needs a union for working conditions and so forth. And uh, so what these fly-by-night producers were doing was taking a script and it would get thinner and thinner because there were a lot of actors whose salary and so forth was based on a guarantee. You're going to go out, the casting officer is going to ring and say, hey, we want you for this fellow playing the chairman of the board or whatever, and uh, it's a several days' work. Well, this fellow would have, say, a two-week guarantee, something of the kind. Mm -hmm. But now, if you had to take retakes at the end of the picture, you didn't have to pay this fellow for those weeks after he had gotten his guarantee. You then just paid him for the time that he was going to work on those retakes or added scenes. Mm -hmm. Well, these fellows were making the script so thin <laughs> that then they were really saying it's retakes when they were doing the other half <laughs> of the script. Idea, yeah. And so we wanted this corrected. Well, the, the good studios, the major studios, they weren't doing this. But we won the point finally, the hardest one we'd bargained for. But as the negotiations went on over the weeks, as they always did, and we'd have time in caucuses sitting around waiting for them to talk about it, finally the final day came, the handshake. The whole negotiations were settled. And I said, well, there is one last point. And the producer said, no, what do you mean? And I said, 18B. Well, they said, we gave you 18B weeks ago. And I said, I know, we're giving it back. And their jaws just dropped. And I said, we've had time to think about it. And you weren't the ones that were, we were trying to get at anyway. And they said, we've just figured out that this would result in you maybe not doing retakes and added scenes that would improve the picture. We would have made them too costly. And we don't want to do that. And when we left the room, the producers had called a meeting among themselves to see how they could police those others that were right. taking advantage of the actors. <laughs> Very right. good. Well, Mr. President, do you want to stay another four years? <laughs> <laughs> no, and with all of this talk, I do, I strongly believe, I've come to the belief since I've been here, that uh, the 22nd Amendment is wrong. I think it's a violation of the people's democratic rights. Mm -hmm. If they want to vote for someone, we shouldn't have a rule that tells them they can't. Good Lord, we've got senators that have been there 40 years with congressmen, the same thing. But I have also always said, and this has not been repeated enough, please, if you <laughs> mention it, I have always said, any president who is promoting this, or I'm not promoting it, but is approving of this, should make it plain it is being done for the president who will follow it. No president can afford to sit in here and, and a thing of that kind and say, do it for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I think I recognize uh, that other people now have suddenly uh, seen the wisdom of getting rid of that amendment, but okay, make it that it will apply to presidents from, from here on. Mm -hmm. I'll go home. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you so much. Well, I have thank a feeling you, I filibustered here. Oh, well, that's grand. <laughs> oh, you can do that any time. Well, We're delighted. Thank you very much. Okay. So good to see you. Thanks, I hope you have a good time on the back platforms. Um, <laughs> we used to. When are we doing that this weekend? Or, uh, uh, no, not this weekend, but uh, next weekend we will. Uh, well, next uh, week from Congress to go to the ranch and we'll be there for the three weeks. On this recess. Right. 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 Oh, right. Right. Oh, right. right. I didn't give you one answer there, but I said yeah. it's false. Sometimes when people say to me, you know, gee, you look so well, don't be. Yeah. And then I pretend that it's true and it really is, and I told them, well, and they want to know what the secret is. I say, well, do you know the story about two psychiatrists? Do you know what the story is? Well, the ones that 
that role, that was Spats, that was from Birmingham, came. Uh, there was a young leader just out of medical school. Both get in the same elevator every day, going to their offices. At the end of the day, the young guy's coffee so his hair is constantly sweating. The little boy's just as dapper as he was. Finally, the young fellow turned to me and said, how do you do it? How can you listen to him all day and look like that? The old boy says, he listens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.